Number 10, Medieval Spawn. Okay, I'm gonna come out right and say this. I know nothing about Spawn. I did not watch the show and I have never really read the comics. I really have no right to be standing here in front of you talking about him but I'm doing it anyways. I'm gonna be talking about Medieval Spawn today. Naturally, Medieval Spawn was not only a hell spawn, but also a knight living in 16th century England. If you think about it, knights were almost like medieval superheroes with tales and stories all of their own. Sir John of York fought during a civil war in England, but was released from his service to Henry II after he and three other knights mistook the king's anger for orders and went and took the life of the Archbishop of Canterbury. Once the knight passed on to the afterlife at the hands of his king's bodyguards, he was sent to hell for his crimes where he made a deal with male Bulgia and returned as a hellspawn. He then went around England committing good deeds in the hopes of redeeming himself, but he continues to survive after being basically bonded to his armor and now possessing anyone who chooses to don his helmet. I should probably start reading Spawn, it actually sounds kind of cool. And number nine is E-Man. E-Man is a truly peculiar hero forged in the comic Crucible who embodies the timeless allure of unconventional superheroes. Hailing from a bygone era of comic book legends, E-Man radiates an unmistakable charisma. Born out of pure energy, his cosmic odyssey spanned galaxies and eons, drawing knowledge from the very fabric of the universe. On Earth, he assumed the identity of Alec Tron, with his emblem being a subtle nod to Einstein's iconic equation. E-Man would later cross paths with Nova Kane, a dancer and scholar whose luminous presence matched his own. And together, they confronted cosmic perils with powers that defied the laws of physics. We're talking energy eruptions, form shifting, and unbridled imagination. Yet, Nova's abilities danced in harmony with their ever-evolving narrative. Now, despite the series's fleeting existence, might I say, E-Man remains renowned as one of the wittiest heroes in comic book history. Perhaps I'm not alone for my yearning for a reboot with an E-Girl leading the way? Just me? Okay, just me. If you're enjoying the video so far, you can support the channel by pressing like and subscribing to Top 10 Nerd, and maybe ringing that notification bell if you want. Number eight, Witchblade. The Witchblade is actually the offspring of the universe's primal forces, the Angelus, or the Light, and the Darkness. To avert mutual destruction, a truce was struck between these two forces, and the Angelus and the Darkness consummated, and in so doing, they conceived the Witchblade, creating peace and balance between them. Now, while most people think of Sarah Pizzini when they think of the Witchblade, Sarah was not the only one to wield the blade, and in fact, was by far the first. When of the oldest Witchblade wielders was actually Samantha. Samantha hails from ancient Roman times, though she herself is not Roman, but instead was a native of an old Celtic town that they overtook named Cecilia. Samantha was captured, but would eventually escape and end up running into druids out in the countryside who believed that she was the one who would be destined to save the other Celts from the Romans. She was given the Witchblade and would set out on a mission to destroy all Romans. Lovely. While a hero, I would definitely say that her morals are a bit more complex, which is what makes Witchblade hosts like her so interesting in the first place. At number seven is Naboo the Wise, recommended by Rodney Lindsay 849 Thank you very much for commenting this suggestion. Naboo the Wise is an ancient cosmic entity which arrived on Earth eons ago, aligning with the Lords of Order to combat universal chaos. His essence now resides in the Helmet of Fate, empowering those who take on the mantle of Dr. Fate. Which means that Dr. Fate's origins stretch over 10 billion years, rooted in the eternal struggle between the Lords of Order and Chaos. On the world of Celia, they were the first sentient beings, incarnations of magic. And around 3,500 years BCE, one Lord, Naboo, descended to Earth, advising Egyptian pharaohs. Naboo's powers forged potent artifacts like the Scarab of Kaifri, hidden for millennia. His greatest creation, the Amulet of Anubis, became a sanctuary for the Lords of Order. During the Ramses' reign, Naboo served as a royal advisor and encountered the Spectre. He also harnessed Nth metal from a crashed starship to create the Claw of Horus. Weakened, he entered into a millennia-long trance, awaiting his return to battle. At number six is E-Man, who was suggested by Paul Cooper 3611. Thank you very much. E-Man is a peculiar hero born from the Cosmic Crucible who exemplifies the enduring lure of unconventional superheroes. 
created during a bygone era of comics, he pulsates with a distinct charm. You see, E-Man is born out of pure energy, and as E-Man traversed galaxies, absorbing wisdom from the cosmos, eventually he landed on Earth, where he embraced the guise of Alex Tron, with his insignia being a nod to Einstein's famed equation. In a twist of fate, E-Man met Nova Kane, a dancer and scholar who'd soon join him as a radiant partner. Together they faced cosmic threats with powers that defied physics. Energy blasts, shape-shifting, guys, the imagination was unbound here. Yet Nova's powers are ebbed and flowed, a testament to their ever-changing narrative. Their adventures weren't complete without Teddy Q, a koala with surprising intellect. Now, although this comic series was short-lived, E-Man has been touted as one of the funniest superheroes of all time. Now, am I the only one who wants a reboot, but this time with an E-girl at the helm? Just me. At number five is Mama Ragan, who was also recommended by Rodney Lindsay 849. Thanks again. In the realm of ancient superheroes, the wizard, once a thunder god, stands as an unyielding figure. He joined the mystical circle of eternity, and as the wizard, he punished Earth's transgressors. After Black Adam's devastation, he sought a successor, ultimately choosing Billy Batson. Despite Billy's obviously flawed nature, the wizard saw potential and passed on his powers, creating Shazam, a force of super strength and flight. The wizard's tale illustrates that even in the most ancient of times, new heroes can emerge from unexpected sources. At number four are the Eternals. The Eternals were forged by the enigmatic Celestials a million years ago, and they stand as ancient superheroes beyond the grasp of mortality. These extraordinary beings, often lurking in the shadows of humanity, exist to safe guard our very species. With powers beyond comprehension, their mysterious existence is marked by reincarnation, emerging anew after each demise. Following grueling civil wars, the Eternals chose a path of harmony and self-improvement, exemplified by their ability to converge into the formidable Unimind. This collective consciousness showcased their immense potential when united. Spanning epochs, they constructed magnificent cities, including Olympia, their current haven. A peculiar connection with the Olympian gods once saw them as Earth's divine representatives, forging an extraordinary alliance. Yet, turmoil always plagued them, eventually leading to madness and self-destruction. Now resurrected and slowly finding their way back to tranquility, these ancient superheroes persevere to this day. And number three is Martian Manhunter. The Martian Manhunter, also known as John Johns, is one of the last living members of the Martian race and one of the oldest characters in DC Comics. His age is estimated to be north of 225 million years, an unimaginable span considering human lifespans. John Johns only made it to Earth recently thanks to a failed experiment, but he had been living in isolation on Mars for untold eons. A calamity about a million years ago wiped out nearly their entire civilization, leaving him as a solitary sentinel of his kind. The shape-shifting, his shape-shifting abilities, telepathy, and superhuman and strength make him a formidable force, and his longevity adds to his aura of invincibility. At number two is Red Sanja. Originating as a supporting character in Conan Barbarian series, Red Sanja swiftly rose to prominence on account of her unwavering resolve and unmatched swordsmanship. With a tragic past as her backdrop, she swore vengeance and embarked on a relentless quest for justice. Marvel Comics chronicled her Avengers until 1986, followed by Dynamite Entertainment's ongoing run. Red Sanja's story underwent transformations, notably in a 2013 reboot, emphasizing empowerment and skill development. Nevertheless, her iconic red hair and distinctive scale male armor endure as her trademarks, showcasing her formidable presence. Red Sanja's indomitable spirit, exceptional sword skills, and enduring legacy solidify her position among ancient superheroes who are truly unstoppable etching her name into the annals of legend. And at number one is Wonder Woman. Now, Wonder Woman's age is indeed a perplexing matter, much like the enigmatic depths of the multiverse itself. Within the vast tapestry of DC Comics, Diana's age appears to be in constant flux, as if she's a paradoxical embodiment of both youth and antiquity. Her lineage traces back to the mythical realm of Greek gods, suggesting a timeless existence. Yet some narratives attempt to reconcile her age with historical events, placing her birth amidst the ancient Amazonians in 12,000 BC. Now, the cinematic adaptation further complicates matters, proposing a staggering age of 5,000 years. In this kaleidoscope of diverging timelines, Wonder Woman becomes a symbol 
of agelessness. A lot of people know the Phoenix Force, but not as many know about the Enigma Force. The Enigma Force is another source of cosmic power, but this one was basically crafted to be the opposite of the darkness in the cosmos, which was made manifest by the god of darkness, the king in black, ruler and god of all symbiotes. No. This entity is so old, it is believed to have come into existence around the same time as the universe, having been around since Null first also came into being. You might recognize this entity more as the hero, Captain Universe from Marvel Comics, but even then, I feel like Captain Planet is still more easily recognizable than Captain Universe would be. When I say Captain, I mean, who first comes to your mind? For me, it's definitely Captain Planet, or maybe Captain America? Let me know your thoughts on that in the comments. The Enigma Force is somewhat different than the Phoenix Force in the sense that it typically takes hold of a host for a shorter period of time, instead choosing to merge with a being simply for the purpose of handling a single universal threat, and then usually leaving that host after the crisis has been averted. Up next, we're moving from the cosmic to the supernatural. I Vampire is Andrew Bennett. Andrew Bennett hails from DC Comics, and he is considered obscure or niche enough that if you actually just Google his name, Andrew Bennett, without anything else in that search field, this man comes comes up instead of this man. Who is Andrew Bennett? He's not that other guy, I'll tell you that much. He is basically a vampire who is a superhero. If you're familiar with the Anne Rice Vampire Chronicles, the novels, you could think of him as a superhero version of Lestat, basically. That's kind of what he is. Sometimes he teams up with other heroes to take on threats, but he also has a lot of his own vampire politics to deal with most of the time. Life ain't easy being a vampire. Now, while some people aren't as maybe Googleable, Artemis is possibly the most well known of these least well known characters on our list. But at the same time, there are probably still a ton of folks out there who really only know Wonder Woman and maybe her mother Hippolyta when it comes to the Wonder Woman mythos and family, the Amazons. Artemis is not a family member per se, but she is one of the Amazons of Themyscira. For a while, she even took up the mantle of Wonder Woman herself. She's used that alias before. She has been a long standing rival to Wonder Woman, and although she tends to have a more brutal approach that sometimes makes her more of an antagonist in stories, she currently is more of a hero or anti-hero at the time of this recording in the comics. The Darkness is something completely different. This character is not from either Marvel or DC Comics, but instead is from the pages of Top Cow. Top Cow Productions is Mark Silvestri's baby. It's an imprint of Image Comics. It has its own universe and its own line, with tons of newer and older comics in terms of the different series that it carries. There is A Man Among Ye and Sunstone, so some of the newer stuff, and also Witchblade and Cyberforce some of the older stuff. Like Cyberforce and Witchblade, The Darkness is also an older series and an older character, both in terms of comic book history and in terms of canon history. If you've heard of Witchblade, The Darkness is another character that very much is based in that world. The Darkness and Witchblade go together like peanut butter and jelly. Like the Witchblade, The Darkness is an entity that takes a host and is passed down through the generations. As such, it's supremely ancient, with its most well-known host in the comics being a Jackie Estacado in the historical modern modern era, but if you want a really metal darkness story, you can actually head all the way back to the days of ancient Rome, or even the Vikings, to see what the darkness was up to in the comics. Because yeah, there was a darkness at those times too. Darkness in general is pretty metal, I feel like. Zealot is another character that is more outside of the mainstream when it comes to comics, which is honestly where I like to go for lists like this. Never before seen being interpreted often for me as, you know, not one of the greatest superheroes of the big two. That is the big two publishers of DC Comics and Marvel, just so you know what I'm talking about when I say that. That being said, Zealot is technically from DC Comics at this point in time, but not originally. Originally, she actually hailed from the indie publisher known as Wildstorm. That was Jim Lee's comic publishing baby that he made when he got tired of larger publishers keeping all the rights for everything that their creatives had ever made for themselves. However, DC later would actually offer to buy Wildstorm and Lee would agree. So now Wildstorm is a DC imprint and universe. So back into the big two it goes. And Jim Lee, of course, is pretty permanently back with DC Comics and has been for some time now. Zealot is an original member of Wildcats and is actually currently serving on the Birds of Prey team in the comics. Kind of fun. Zealot is Xana, an alien from the planet Kara who has lived for thousands of years. So she really old. She ancient. 
Not all mutants are from the modern day. Take a look at this next hero. Exodus is a super, super old mutant from Marvel Comics. For most of his life, he was in a stasis, so that's probably why you didn't see him around throughout all of history. Initially, Exodus was more of a villain in the comics, at least somewhat, and I'm sure he'll go back to being a villain at some point again. But during the Krakoan period of X-Men, there haven't actually been a ton of true mutant villains. This is because all the mutants decided to band together as one nation, working together for the greater good of mutant kind, all part of Krakoa or Arako, as opposed to fighting against one another. So save for a few, most mutants, even the ones that are villainous normally, have been acting as heroes. If you're wondering how old Exodus is, he was around during the 12th century and actually fought in the Crusades, being known then as the noble Grand Duke Bene du Paris. During his travels, he ran into Apocalypse and was chosen to become his champion. And even back then, Exodus had kind of a sense of heroic valiance about him. When Apocalypse attempted to pit Exodus against his friend, another ancient Marvel hero, the Black Knight, you may have heard of him, Exodus refused to fight him, and instead turned on Apocalypse. At number 7 is the Eternal Warrior. Valiant Comics introduces us to Gilad Anipada, the Eternal Warrior. Unlike typical caped crusaders, Gilad's tale is one of immortality and ceaseless dedication. Bestowed with eternal life, Gilad has honed his skills over millennia. He's become a master of combat, wielding centuries of experience as his weapon. But his role goes beyond mere physical prowess. See, Gilad's mission is to safeguard the Geomancer, a mystical guardian chosen by the Earth itself. Geomancers are not your everyday heroes. They're in tune with our very planet with the power to commune with nature. Number six, Ogon Bat. Okay, Ogon Bat is a unique and pretty cool character in his own right, but what makes him even cooler is that he was actually one of the world's first ever superheroes ever, even technically coming before Superman. Originating from Japan as the god of justice and protector of the weak, his origin is that he was originally an Atlantean who was sent forward in time 10,000 years to defend the modern world from evil. He wields a scepter that fires bolts of energy, causes many earthquakes, and slices through steel. He himself was immortal, could fly, breathe underwater, had x-ray vision, and possessed superhuman strength, speed, and invulnerability to bullets and lasers. He was summoned by a little girl who would call on him, causing a sparkle to appear around, which then turned into a bat, and then turned into the hero when it found its enemy. While he initially started as a comic, he also has a TV show that appeared in several different countries around the world. And I think he looks really cool. Number five is Arion. Arion is a figure often overshadowed by the more celebrated heroes of our time. Born to the cosmic forces of good and strife, Arion emerged as a lord of order, a manifestation of righteousness incarnate. His twin brother, Garn Danuth, embodied chaos, setting the stage for an eternal struggle between order and disorder. But it was Arion who shone the brightest in the annals of Atlantis, a prominent sorcerer king and scientist, a true polymath of his era. He stood as a beacon of hope, a paragon of virtue, and the very first hero of Atlantis. Yet beyond Atlantis, his legacy extends to the Amazons, etching his name into the tapestry of time as a hero unparalleled in ancient lore. Number four, Anthro. Created by Howard Post, Anthro is considered the first boy on Earth, existing in prehistoric times. He lived with his family during a period when the world was still in its primal stages. Anthro's curiosity and adaptability drove him to explore the challenges and mysteries of a world populated by both primitive creatures and nascent human tribes. Through his adventures, Anthro unwittingly played a significant role in shaping humanity's development and survival, often making use of his ingenuity ingenuity and courage to overcome obstacles, while also being part of some modern day stories thanks to time travel. He has popped up in Crisis on Infinite Earths, Armageddon 2001, Zero Hour, Team 13, and even Final Crisis, and even been to the Marvel Universe where he interacted with Devil Dinosaur. Anthro's narrative explores the struggle for survival, the emergence of intelligence, and the foundations of human civilization itself. His story reflects the essence of human curiosity, resilience, and the quest for progress, serving as a symbol of humanity's earliest steps into the unknown. His powers are, well, pretty much non-existent. He doesn't really have any. He's just a person who's really smart and creative. But he has played a part in some big events and in more than just the background kind of way. At number three is Gilgamesh. 
Now, the legend of Gilgamesh, a name echoing through the annals of time, transcending the boundaries of myth and history as the king of Uruk, a city-state nestled in the cradle of Mesopotamia. His story, carved into the very clay tablets of ancient Sumer, is a testament to human ambition and the quest for immortality. But what if I were to tell you that Gilgamesh's legacy may have transcended mere mortals? Enter the Forgotten One, a mysterious figure shrouded in the myths of time. A wanderer, a warrior, he bore the mantle of Gilgamesh, among many others, including Hercules, as if plucking stories from the pages of mythology itself. The Forgotten One, aka Gilgamesh's exile from the Eternals, his kingdom in Olympus, and his ultimate call to battle against the Deviants bear a striking resemblance to the epic journey of Gilgamesh. Is it a mere coincidence, or could there be a deeper connection between these timeless narratives? The mysteries of the past continue to unravel, revealing the intricate tapestry of human history and its intersections with the world of myth and legend. Number two, Etrigan. Etrigan the demon was the firstborn of Belial, who was such a handful that Belial exiled Etrigan's mother to Masak Mavdil and told his son that his antics drove her away. That's rough. His antics ended up even driving Belial out of hell for several decades, returning with another son born of a mortal witch named Merlin. Etrigan was originally summoned to Earth to serve Merlin in a desperate final attempt to protect Camelot from the evil witch Morgana Le Fay. Merlin bound the demon to a mortal peasant named Jason while Merlin went into hiding to rest, and these two lived a very long and brutal life together throughout history. Basically, how it would go is that Etrigan incited war and strife, and in return, Jason gained wealth and status. Not a horrible idea for some people. Despite sharing the same body though, the demon and his host are usually at odds with each other, and Jason Blood retains a lot of guilt based on Etrigan's demonic actions, which I think played a part in him being a bit more heroic, or as heroic as a demon can be, I guess. And at number one is Beowulf, a legendary Gaetish king who truly embodies an ancient superhero who defies the test of time. His 50-year reign was marked by epic battles, but it was the confrontation with the dragon guarding the Holy Grail's secrets that ultimately sealed his fate. Intriguingly, James Allison, a character with the ability to recall past incarnations, speculated that these heroic exploits might be embedded in our collective memory, hinting at a deeper connection between myth and reality. If you're wondering who that dude is, it's just some guy who can see past lives, no big deal. Anyways, Marvel Comics added a unique twist to Beowulf's tale, suggesting that he survived his dragon battle and re-emerged as an immortal warrior in the modern age. This reincarnated hero engaged in friendly rivalries with figures like Theseus and joined forces with Hercules to confront new gods. Beowulf's timeless narrative serves as a testament to the enduring appeal of ancient superheroes, reminding us that their legends continue to captivate transcending generations and even reality itself. Number 10, Namor. While many folks think of Namor as being an anti hero and honestly he most definitely is, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe he's only really been presented to us as like a straight up villain. Albeit a straight up villain with a pretty powerful and universally relatable motive I would say. He does what he does in an effort to protect his people and to defend the oceans from those who would pollute and destroy them. AKA, that's us. I think we can all get behind that message. I know I can as someone that you know doesn't want our oceans to bubble and boil and just be filled with garbage. However, Namor's methods honestly could use some work from a heroic standpoint. Namor is presented as being both brutal and cruel when it comes to his actions, which makes him a villain in the MCU. While he is around 100 years old in the comics at this point, his live action adaptation was made considerably older and is estimated based on his origin to actually be around 500 years old. Woo! Number 9, Black Adam. Another anti-hero? I promise this won't be a common occurrence. There are two main different origin stories for Black Adam. In the pre-New 52 era of DC, circa 1200 BC, the wizard Shazam became a high priest to the pharaoh Ramses II of Egypt. This is where he met the young prince Teth Adam of Kondok. Ramses, Ramses, Ram, Ramses, Ramses' son. There we go. Teth Adam impressed the wizard with his fairness and decency and boom! He was granted the power. But in the more recent continuity, Teth Adam was born in Egypt in the 26th century BCE along the banks of the Nile as part of the Kondaki tribe. And it did not take long for him to be forced into a life of unwilling servitude. Very different. His entire family lost their lives except for his nephew, Amon. Amon would save Teth Adam's life, which got him the recognition of the wizard Shazam, who turned Amon into his champion. Amon then shared this power with his uncle, Teth Adam, but not seeing eye to eye on how to use 
use the power, Black Adam took his own nephew off of the board and stole the power for himself. This was before he was either banished, stuck in a scarab, or locked away in a tomb, depending on which era you want to talk about. But no matter when we are talking about, Black Adam has been a threat to everyone, and he took on almost the entire world when his family was taken from him back in DC's World War III. Number 8. Rotath of Lemuria Rotath of Lemuria is a common example of how magic was presented often in stories that take place in the Hyborian Age, especially in regards to Conan's story there. He made his first appearance in issue number 37 of Conan the Barbarian from the 1970s, when almost everyone who read comics or otherwise was into the sword and sorcery genre. In this same issue, Rotath was killed by Kull after he was hired by the king of Lemuria who was frightened of Rotath's power. As he died, Rotath cursed both the king and Kull, casting a spell so that he might return. And so he did. This time in a golden body, but still he ended up being defeated here. This time not by Kull directly, but instead by, well, a giant slug after fighting against Conan and Juma. This is a true story by the way. <laughs> Man, I hate when I get defeated by giant slugs. Ah, the slugs, man, they get you. It's funny because all you need is like a little bit. Age, all you need is like a little bit of table salt. <laughs> Take that sucker off the board. Back again to the Wonder Woman mythos. Nubia is another character that is not well known from that, I would say, group of heroes. And what's even more surprising to me is that I actually thought Artemis might be lesser known than Nubia, but it turns out that Artemis is likely even more well known considering that she's actually made, overall, more comic book appearances. Whereas Nubia, despite being a literal, sometimes sister to Wonder Woman, depending on her origin story, and more recently, a queen of the Amazons has not appeared as often, which surprises me, but here we are. Nubia, like Wonder Woman and Artemis, is also considered to be ancient. Her current origin in the Prime Earth continuity had her as an ancient princess who was actually reborn from the Well of Souls after her death, becoming the Amazonian warrior Nubia. Nubia was the last to actually be born from the Well of Souls and was born around the same time as Diana in the current main continuity. So in that version of the story, they grow up together and that kind of gives them that sisterly bond. The next one might surprise a lot of folks out there. Who is Angela? Well, although she originated in the pages of Images Spawn, she is actually now Thor's long lost sister. Wait, what? Okay, so here's the story. Angela was initially a Hellspawn hunter from the pages of Spawn comics. While Spawn technically gets his powers from Hell, Angela kind of works on behalf of Heaven in the war against Heaven and Hell. So that's kind of how that goes. And as such, she therefore hunts down people like Spawn. Hellspawn, that is. She was created by Neil Gaiman and Todd McFarlane. But there was an issue with that. The issue of who really owned this character? Who had those creating rights? While Gaiman had made her for Spawn while working for Todd, McFarlane later claimed to own the rights solely to her character. And that's where uh, things got rough between these two. The two entered a legal battle with Gaiman fighting to prove that he actually also had rights to Angela as a co-creator. The court sided with him and money also had to be determined for how much Gaiman was like owed based on how much money had been made by the use of this character that he co-created. During this time, Gaiman decided to bring Angela over to Marvel and even wrote 1602 for Marvel Comics just to help cover his legal costs. He actually dedicated 1602 to Todd and I quote for making it necessary. Angela, when she came over to Marvel, ended up after 1602 being incorporated into the main continuity where she became the long lost angelic sister of the god and superhero Thor. Up next, Shine Shining Knight is a hero I didn't even know about before writing this uh, this video for you guys. I love when I learn something new and then I get to share it with you all, whether that's something I've read or something I found through my own research. It honestly feels really special to me to share stuff like that with you. Shining Knight is basically like what would happen if Captain America was a medieval knight instead of like a World War II super soldier war hero. Shining Knight hails from DC Comics though, he's not from Marvel, just to be clear. He was initially a hero in the 6th century who was frozen in four centuries before emerging once more in what we'd consider to be Captain America's original era, actually, the 1940s. During his time as a hero in the 1940s, he was known as a member of the All-Star Squadron and the Seven Soldiers of Victory. So yeah, like I said, basically Captain America, but like, what if he was a medieval knight? I love it. Finally, we have Egamoto. For those who are unfamiliar, Egamoto is the Sorcerer Supreme, or he was a 
Sorcerer Supreme, anyways. While he has acted as an antagonist to the current Sorcerer Supreme, Stephen Strange, in the past, initially Agamotto himself was a protector of Earth and a hero, way, way back in the past. He even served on the Avengers, or rather, the prehistoric Avengers, that is, the Avengers of 1 million BCE. Number 10, Anti Monitor. Anti Monitor is a supremely powerful villain who threatened the very existence of the multiverse during the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths. He controls the antimatter universe, and his very existence is deeply tied to the destruction of all things. So much so that even after the Anti Monitor was defeated, Necron ended up trapping the Anti Monitor's body. It was later revealed in Blackest Night that Necron had basically been using Anti Monitor's corpse as a source of power for the Black Central Power Battery. So, yeah, even in death, he's scary. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, please, please, please be sure to show us that you love us by clicking that like button and coming back. Come on back. Number nine, Rotath of Lemuria. Rotath of Lemuria is a prominent figure in the stories from the Hyborian Age. Rotath made his debut in Conan the Barbarian, issue number 37, which was published in the 70s during the peak, I would say, of the sword and sorcery genre. The King of Lemuria was scared of Rotath's power, understandably so, as many magic users back in those days of these comics tended to be pretty evil, which Rotath um, also was. So he hired Kull to defeat and kill him. However, as he was dying, Rotath cursed both the king and Kull and cast a spell so that he could return. He didn't just return too, he came back with a gold body. Number 8. Grail. Grail was born on the same day as Wonder Woman, who is believed to be a few millennia old based on Amazon history, and considering when the Amazons left man's world and how long after that Diana was brought into their world as Hippolyta's daughter. Though that still means that she's likely considerably younger than her father, who is also super old. Grail, the daughter of Amazon assassin Myrna and Darkseid, is the offspring of one of the most feared villains of the DC Universe. That's right, we're talking about Darkseid. Darkseid is known for being a powerful adversary to all major superheroes, I'd say, but especially the Justice League. He's a master strategist, he's incredibly strong and durable, and additionally, he of course has his own mega beams that he can use to destroy his enemies. Or I guess displace them through time. Alright, number seven, Yuga Khan. Yuga Khan is the first ever tyrannical ruler of the planet of Apocalypse, and the father of both Drax, who would become the Infinity Man, and Uxas, who would become Dark side. Given his nature as essentially a god and one that fathered the current gods, quote unquote, Yuga Khan is certainly ancient, being essentially immortal. As an example, before the fourth world is even fully formed, Yuga Khan, alongside his wife Hegra and their sons, ruled Apocalypse, creating one of the most feared empires in the entire universe. But being such an astronomically powerful being, it wasn't enough. Yuga Khan was obsessed with becoming the most powerful being in the universe and wanted to be able to essentially control it all. But he was also obsessed with finding out the reason for why it all existed in the first place. So he's a conqueror, but also a philosopher, which is nice. This obsession is what brought him to the source wall, getting trapped in it while trying to unravel the mysteries of the source. All the inhabitants of New Genesis are way, 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 way stronger, faster, and smarter than humans, being almost all on a level akin to Superman while also being immortal. But Yuga Khan, he is the most powerful of them all. So much so that after an absolutely colossal effort, Effort, Yuga Khan was even able to break free of the source wall. That act released energies that could be felt throughout the galaxy and caused the universe itself to shake. He then replenished his power by absorbing the entire life force of the planet Velos and all its inhabitants, and then did the same thing with millions of other worlds while on his way back to Apocalypse. His return to Apocalypse made everyone tremble, including its current ruler, his own son, Darkseid, who he imprisoned in the core of the planet. Most recently, though, Yuga Khan was one of the beings empowering Shazam during Dark Side War. A minor so Conan. I went really Conan with this I, list. I respect that though. I mean, there's lots of old guys because. Mine are all like spacey. Yeah, it's so true though. Space is old. <laughs> Number six, Kulan Gath. Kulan Gath is probably one of the most iconic villains that Conan the Barbarian has had in the comics. He is so old, in fact, that he also became the enemy of another ancient villain known as the Mutant, the Mutant External, more specifically, Selene. Not to be confused with the Eternals, who are their own thing entirely. These are the Externals, not the Eternals. Kulan Gath made his first full feature appearance back in 1972 in the comics in Conan the Barbarian issue number 15. Number 5. Lar Flees 
Larf Fleas, or Agent Orange, is one unique character in the emotional spectrum, and that's because he's the sole wielder of the Orange Light of Avarice. He is the only member of the Orange Lantern Corps. Larf Fleas is driven by an insatiable greed that grants him dominion over all that he desires, driving him into conflict with whoever possesses what it is that he desires, and over the power of the Orange Lanterns, which represent greed. His power is centered on his ability to conjure constructs using the stolen identity and forms of those he has absorbed into his horde, making him basically an army unto himself. This ability extends even to abstract concepts and beings, showcasing the extent of his control. The big thing about Larflees is that since he's spent so much time with his orange lantern and ring, he has basically become the orange lantern and ring himself. This energy grants him huge levels of power. His constructs are virtually indestructible and can overwhelm even the most powerful opponents. However, Larflees' power comes at the cost of his individuality as his insatiable greed makes him less of a person and more of a living embodiment of greed itself. Even without the power of the Orange Lanterns though, his race is already basically immortal, with Larflees himself being billions of years old, and with enough power that I seriously doubt he'll be going down anytime soon. Number 4, Thalsa Doom. When it comes to Conan, he definitely is a type when it comes to some of his greatest enemies. Typically, he's caught in the midst of epic battles against evil sorcerers or wizards. In Thalsa Doom's case, his brand of evil magic user is is Necromancer. While Thulsa Doom became a famous Conan villain thanks to his appearance as the main antagonist in the 1982 Conan the Barbarian movie, he initially started out as a villain for what some consider to be a more nuanced barbarian hero also created by Robert E. Howard, Call of Atlantis or Call the Conqueror as he was also known. Number 3, Shuma Gorath. Yes, it is a giant tentacled eyeball, but hold off on the laughter because Shuma Gorath, the destroyer, the conqueror of midnight, the all killer of the dawn, is a ridiculously ancient being and greatest of the old gods, or the many angled ones. Among his many powers is the ability to communicate with and control others nearby and across entire dimensions. He can create and direct powerful blasts of mystical energy and affect transmutations on a planetary scale. His skin alone is difficult to damage, even with the most powerful of magics. While his form seems pretty silly, cause it is, it's actually only a shell containing his power and he can alter this appearance however he sees fit. This is actually because it's not even his true form. His true form is apparently not even comprehensible to us humans. Boo. Shumagorath can destroy multiple galaxies solely through his aura pressure and this old god has also the ability to destroy entire realities. He is the most powerful in his home dimension, just like others of his kind, and only part of his power has actually appeared on Earth. And with the stuff he has done with that fraction of power, that should tell you just how powerful he is. Number two, Scrawls. All of them. There's many. They're not all bad, but they started bad. That's right, Skrulls are some of the oldest villains around, although they aren't exactly considered clean cut villains anymore. In fact, some Skrulls have even become better known as heroes in recent years. Originally though, Skrulls appeared as a villainous alien race in Fantastic Four Volume 1, Issue Number 2, and who were focused solely during their appearance on basically conquering Earth. This was right after the FF team had been introduced in the previous issue, which was basically all Issue 1 was really about, the team's origin story. The Skrulls knew that the FF were the main protectors of Earth, at this point anyways, despite the fact that they had just sort of, you know, started their superhero careers, which is pretty crazy. Knowing this, the Skrulls decided to pose as the FF and commit a bunch of villainous deeds while impersonating them, hoping to discredit the Fantastic Four to the point that the US military would capture and then kill the Fantastic Team. With the Fantastic Four disposed of, the Earth would then be ripe for the Skrulls taking. Of course, this plan was foiled as the FF trapped the imposters and ended up posing as them, taking the Skrulls idea but executing it much better. Disguised as the Skrulls, the FF would tell the Skrull leader that Earth's defenses were too powerful for the invasion to succeed, causing them to just call off the invasion. The Skrulls that originally posed as the Fantastic Four members were forced to stay behind after the invasion left, taking the form of cows and living in apparent peace, as they apparently really enjoyed living as cows. Skrulls themselves can live hundreds of years and their empire has existed for tens of millions of years, which means those cows are going to be really, really old. Can you imagine you're like millions of years old conquerors and then you go to the planet you make all your like all the way there and then someone's like you know what? I think it's gonna be too hard and they're just like you're right let's just go you're right you're right we should just go and then those guys are just like why don't we just be cows and that's your life gr moo <laughs> number one the great darkness you can't get much more ancient than existing before creation itself. 
The Great Darkness was the literal darkness and nothingness that existed before the Presence ever came to be. When the Presence, aka God in DC Comics, said, let there be light, the Great Darkness is the one who went into hiding. At some point, a clan known as the Brugeria, I believe is how you pronounce it, attempted a ritual to reawaken the Great Darkness in order to destroy God and reshape the universe. Instead of being completely evil though, this was more like an animal who was confused and didn't understand its power or what its purpose even was in the universe. The Great Darkness, also sometimes referred to as the Great Evil Beast, went on a warpath, easily defeating many heroes and waging a solo assault on heaven itself, decimating everything in its way to demand answers from the presence. It even caused the three main figures of hell to form a union with each other just in case something went wrong. When the Great Darkness reached heaven though, it met Swamp Thing of all people, who taught it the concept of good and evil, explaining that one couldn't survive without the other. The darkness then reached up and God reached back and they became one and the same as like yin and yang or as a balance. Recently though, the great darkness played a large role in the Dark Crisis event. It's basically the overarching villain of the entire DC multiverse, but also just kind of force of nature doing its thing. Starting off our list at number 10 is Xena Warrior Princess. I bet you didn't expect to see this one. Sure, Xena Warrior Princess started out as a TV show, but the character was popular enough to get a few comic book series all of her own, from bigger publishers too, like Dark Horse and Dynamite Comics. Way back in the day, in her early 20s, Xena proved to be a courageous leader when she led her village against a local warlord. But they were defeated, and Xena, being one of the only survivors, was banished. Eventually, she formed a relationship with another warlord known as Boreas, and she even joined him, becoming a warlord herself. Xena the Warlord became known and feared across ancient China, Siberia, Japan, Norway, Britannia, and Greece as a very capable warlord, earning her the name Warrior Princess, but also the name Destroyer of Nations. Luckily, this destroyer changed her ways and instead became a protector of the innocent traveling with her companions all across the ancient world. Number 9, Hippolyta. This queen's history begins thousands of years ago. Around 1300 BC, the Greek pantheon held a meeting convened by the goddesses. They were discussing the creation of a race of humans that would champion their ideals. Now the male gods, including Zeus and Ares, did not seem too interested, and Hera did not wish to go against her husband, so it was left to the other five primary Greek goddesses. They decided to to travel into the underworld, where they came upon the Well of Souls, where the souls of all the women who were taken out by man's hatred were gathered. The goddesses took these souls and went and dropped them into a lake in Greece. The souls mixed with the clay and the stone of the lake bed to form the Amazons, and the first one to emerge from the waters was Hippolyta. The goddesses appointed Hippolyta to be queen, and they decreed that the Amazons were to spread the message of peace, tolerance, and equality by being super dope warriors. Yes, Wonder Woman is also pretty ancient too, but mama came first, so here we are. Number eight, Black Adam. Okay, so there are two different main origin stories for Black Adam. In the pre-New 52 era of DC, circa 1200 BC, the wizard Shazam became a high priest to the pharaoh or Ramses II of Egypt. This is where he met the young prince Teth Adam of Kondok. Teth Adam was Ramses' son. Teth Adam impressed the wizard with his fairness and decency, and boom, he was granted the power. But in the more recent continuity, Teth Adam was born in Egypt in the 26th century BCE along the banks of the Nile as part of the Kondoki tribe. And it didn't take too long for him to be forced into a life of unwilling servitude. His entire family lost their lives except for his nephew Amon. Amon would save Teth Adam's life, which got him the recognition of the wizard Shazam, who turned Amon into his champion. Amon shared this power with his uncle Teth Adam, but not seeing eye to eye on how to use the power, Black Adam took his own nephew off the board and stole his power. This was way before he was either banished, stuck in a scarab, or locked away in a tomb, depending on which era you want to talk about. Also, for the trolls out there, I know Adam is primarily a villain, but he has also been a hero, even joining the Justice Justice Society and the Justice League, so get off my back. Number seven, Skrulls. The Skrulls have been a part of the comic book universe for a long time, and while some of them have become heroes in recent years, they were initially introduced as villains. In the second issue of Fantastic Four, they were portrayed as an alien race with designs for world domination, hoping to conquer Earth by infiltrating it and basically posing as the Fantastic Four, committing evil deeds. Their goal was to discredit the Fantastic Four and have the FF's own national government and military capture and eliminate them. 
See, because then Earth would have no protectors and they'd be able to take it for themselves. Look, this was early days of comics, so everyone else wasn't really like as prominent yet. However, the FF managed to capture the Skrull impersonators and posed as them instead, causing the Skrull leader to call off the invasion. They did a little switcheroo there. They were like, we see your plan and we will do it, but we will do it better. In the end, the Skrulls who posed as the FF were left behind and took the form of cows, living in apparent peace on the planet's surface, but isolated from their home world and of course their people. Although they didn't seem to mind. I think they were pretty happy as cows. <laughs> as we saw alluded to in the MCU's Secret Invasion, Skrulls can actually live for hundreds of years, and in the comics, their empire has existed for tens of millions of years. Despite them losing that battle though, the Skrulls would not give up on Earth and years later would almost claim it for themselves during the comic book Secret Invasion event where they were led by the Skrull Queen, Varonki. Number 6, Darkseid. Darkseid is a powerful and formidable villain in the DC Comics universe, ruling over Apocalypse with an army of loyal soldiers known as the Parademons. Despite facing challenges and battles against numerous heroes and villains, Darkseid has managed to defeat many of them, including seemingly defeating the entirety of the Justice League on multiple occasions. What sets Darkseid apart from other villains is his sense of inevitability and unstoppable power. This is illustrated by the catchphrase Darkseid is, which has become iconic in comic book history and was coined by Grant Morrison. The phrase Darkseid is basically means that Darkseid is inevitable and all powerful. You don't have to finish the sentence because he just is. He is an evil constant who must and will always exist. A terrifying thought when you've experienced firsthand his brutal power and iron will. Darkseid's immense strength and ruthless army make him a terrifying and honestly unforgettable villain. Number 5. Rakil la la la. Sure, Rakil might be in prison currently, or at least that's where she was put at the end of the Empire event last I checked, but that doesn't mean she is down and out for the count. Au contraire. Instead, it simply means Means that she's likely biding her time and she's eventually once more going to attempt to do something to manipulate her grandson further into unifying and dominating other worlds. As she orchestrated the fusion of the Kree and Skrull together with the Kree Skrull Alliance. And if I've missed anything here and she's doing something else or she was eliminated, trust me, I do not think she's eliminated. For years we thought she had perished along with the rest of her people when her world was destroyed by Galactus. And for years we were apparently wrong in this. What's to stop her from surprising us yet? again. You know what I mean? Number 4. Mandrak the Dark Monitor. Mandrak was once or is, depending on what you believe, Dax Novu. And Dax Novu was once a part of the Monitor. Following the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths, the injuries the Monitor had suffered caused it to basically splinter apart somewhat, dividing its body and creating other smaller Monitors. Dax Novu was one of these Monitors. He eventually realized that the Monitors were parasitic beings who were feeding on the energies of the multiverse, slowly consuming and destroying it. He informed the other Monitors but was basically shunned for attempting to share his realization, and this is pretty much would turn him, well, dark. Dax then became corrupted, turning into a dark monitor known as Mandrak. Number 3, Thalsa Doom. Conan, the famous barbarian created by Robert E. Howard, has faced many powerful enemies on his adventures. However, he often finds himself in epic battles against evil sorcerers and wizards, as so many barbarians from that age of comics do. One of his most well known foes, Thalsa Doom, is a necromancer who uses dark magic to achieve his wicked, wicked goals. Thalsa Doom made his first comic book appearance way back in Monsters on the Prowl, issue number 16, in terms of the comics. Interestingly, Thalsa Doom was originally created as a villain for Robert E. Howard's other barbarian hero, Call of Atlantis, who was considered by some to be a more complex and well-rounded character than Conan was. However, Thalsa Doom's appearance as the main antagonist in the 1982 film, Conan the Barbarian, solidified his place in popular culture as one of Conan's greatest enemies. And so, that's how we see him today. Number 2, Apocalypse. There is a whole reality based on the question of what would happen if Apocalypse was basically unable to be stopped. This reality is known as Earth 295 aka the Age of Apocalypse or AOA if you will. And in this world Apocalypse becomes pretty much inevitable thanks to the early demise of one man, Charles Xavier, Professor X. The reality of Age of Apocalypse just goes to show you what a force Apocalypse is and if an alternate reality where Apocalypse literally rules the world is somehow not enough to convince you of how unstoppable this villain can be, you can also turn to the more recent X-Men event Ten of Swords which happened a few years 
years ago, aka the Otherworld Tournament. During this fight, Apocalypse faced his wife, who was possessed by Annihilation, and even against the seemingly unbeatable foe that was Annihilation, who can like pretty much never lose, Apocalypse managed to win, saving his wife and freeing her from the influence of the Golden Helm, while also saving basically all of Krakoa, Mutant Kind, and Otherworld. Yeah, so this wasn't his most villainous moment. But normally Apocalypse is a villain, and this just serves as another example to show you how he basically can't be stopped. Number 1. Great Darkness The Great Darkness is in essence one of the oldest evils in the DC multiverse. In the beginning, it was said there was only darkness, however a small light was also created and eventually it grew. When the creator said let there be light, the darkness was forced to shy away and retreat, but its screams of protest left a mark on the light, a flaw, which is believed to basically have become the DC multiverse. At one point, a call attempted to reawaken the Great Darkness and, and use it as a weapon to destroy God and reshape all of existence. This created a divide with various beings allying themselves with the Great Darkness, fighting on the side of Hell, while others work to oppose the entity, allying themselves with the side of Heaven, the side of Light if you will. The Great Darkness has long been tied to the stories of heroes like Swamp Thing and John Constantine, making its first appearance in the Swamp Thing series from 1982. Coming in at number 10 today is the Silver Surfer. The Surfer was originally North Norrin Rad, an astronomer from the planet Zen La. When Rad discovered that Galactus, the devourer of worlds, had come to devour Zen La's life force, Rad struck a deal with the cosmic entity to seek out uninhabited planets that Galactus could consume. Eventually, Galactus became aware of Earth, our little green planet, and he set out to make it his next meal. The surfer arrived just in time to warn the Fantastic Four of Galactus' arrival, which was his initial reveal into the universe of Marvel Comics in Fantastic Four number 48 to number 50. And that started a great relationship between the Surfer and the superhero family. The Silver Surfer's adventures often center on philosophical conundrums as much as physical challenges, and Stan Lee has used the Surfer as a vessel to express some of the writer's own worldviews. But why is he on the list of ancient heroes? Well, we don't actually have a specific birth year for Norrin Rad, but the Silver Surfer himself has stated that it has been a millennia since he was first transformed by Galactus, and he was a mature member of his species when that happened. And that species is a long lived one, so it's very safe to say that the Silver Surfer is quite old indeed. Number 9. Mystique To some of us humans, hundreds of years ago feels just as ancient as millions of years ago, maybe. The Marvel mutant known as Mystique, while you wouldn't think it, has stated that she was not born in the last century and that she's actually over 100 years old. Mystique has a very complex and unrevealed origin. Like Marvel started by introducing her and have only given us brief moments where she has shown up in the timeline prior to that. So this point is more so cobbling together various things she and others has said that point to her being quite freaking old. Mystique has been known to be with her wife, Destiny, by 1895 and she stated that quote, solitude was my natural natural state for a hundred years, which basically implies that she was born before 1800. In 1921 she met Logan in Kansas City and they all worked together in Scotland shortly before World War II, but in an early appearance in Uncanny X-Men number 170, Mystique dreamt that she was in the year 1783, which is specified as being 170 years before her birth. As the comic was published in 1983, this would make her 30 years old at the time of the story, but that has since been retconned. So as I said, it's a little convoluted. Despite the fact that it is unknown when exactly she was born, it can be assumed that Mystique was born in the month of September, because apparently her birthstone is a sapphire. Twing. While she might not be as ancient as others on this list, she is still much older than you think and an incredibly hard mutant to bring down. Number 7. XO Manowar In the world of Valiant Comics' XO Manowar, a long long time ago, aka 402 AD, a barbarian tribe known as the Visigoths were battling the Romans for territory in Italy. One of these barbarians was Eric of Dacia, a warrior of the Visigoths and the nephew of the king. After the Romans sneakily captured the barbarian women and children, Eric gathered together a group of warriors and went off to attack the Romans at night. On their way to the Roman stronghold though, the Visigoths came across strangely dressed warriors who turned out to be an alien species known as the Vine. Using their advanced weapons, the Vine 
easily defeated the barbarians, and the remaining Visigoths were taken aboard the alien mothership. Now, whilst being herded on board the ship, Eric and his friends managed to overpower their jailer and escape to find shelter within another area of the ship where they witnessed a vine ritual in which a priest presented a chosen warrior with a semi sentient armor called Shanhara. After a number of years, Eric and the others finally managed to gather enough tools and escape their cages. They made their way to the armory where they found themselves trapped by Commander Trill and his soldiers. But in what could have been their final moments, Shanhara had deemed Eric worthy, granting him superhuman abilities and the means to escape his captures, eventually becoming a hero in the modern era. Number six. Valkyrie. There have been a few people to take up the role of Valkyrie, but the first was Brunhilde. Back in the day, Odin realized that he needed to give man a paradise to live in after passing on. Thank you. Odin chose a princess named Brunhilde to be his Valkyrie, making her responsible for taking the souls of the warriors who perished in battle with honor and bringing them to Valhalla. Brunhilde led the rest of the Valkyrie as a group of warrior goddesses who would appear over the battlefields of mortal worshippers of the Asgardian gods and choose which of them were worthy to be taken to Valhalla. Brunhilde led this group for centuries. Like the other Asgardians, Brunhilde had godly powers, but she also possessed some Valkyrie's specific traits like the ability to perceive and sense the coming of death on a person, the power to teleport to Asgard through willpower, and she was one of the most capable fighters the Asgardians had to offer outside of Thor and maybe a few others. Number 5. Gaia Speaking of Thor though, last time we talked about Thor's papa, Odin, and for this list I think we should talk about Thor's mama. Gaia. Gaia was one of the elder gods who materialized on Earth way before any life ever appeared here. Unfortunately, the rest of the gods, following the example of the serpent elder god Set, started consuming each other, which turned all but Gaia into demons. In order to better protect life on Earth, Gaia summoned the Demiurge and mated with it to give birth to her first son ever, Demogorge the God Eater. This Demogorge devoured all the demons except those that escaped, like Set and Cthone. Gaia then then merged with the earth itself and dedicated herself to guiding evolution, and that sounds pretty heroic to me. She is one of the oldest and most powerful deities in Marvel Comics, which makes her and Odin's eventual son, Thor, even more of a force to be reckoned with. Number 4. Hawkman Hawkman is a bit of a doozy to talk about. Essentially, he has two main origins. He was either a space cop or a reincarnated prince. Since we are talking old and ancient today, we will focus on the reincarnated prince story. Basically, Hawkman's secret identity is Carter Hall, an archaeologist and museum curator who is actually a reincarnation of the ancient Egyptian prince Khufu. Khufu, who would become known as Hawkman, discovered an alien spacecraft from the planet Thanagar. Powered by an anti-gravity metal element called the Nth Metal, which transformed his soul and doomed him and his love to be reincarnated over and over and over again throughout time. Some of his incarnations include Brian Kent, the Silent Knight from 5th century Britain, Conrad von Grimm, the son of a blacksmith in 14th century Germany, Captain John Smith of the 16th century, Hannibal Hawks, the Nighthawk in the American Old West, Detective James Wright, a Pinkerton detective in the 20th century, and finally, Carter Hall himself. Number 3. Venom Since we all know Venom as being an enemy of Spider-Man, it's easy to forget that he has been around for a much longer amount of time than the web slinger himself, at least in the fictional world. The symbiote that later became known as Venom was spawned at some point during the reign of the Dark Elder God, Null, which is a long one, and there is no specific Earth year when this happened, so it's hard to say just how ancient this symbiote actually is, but we know he had a life long before encountering Spider-Man. Unfortunately, the symbiote's memories have all been altered or erased a whole whack of times. It has been said that Venom was the 998th of its lineage, hatching from a clutch of eggs in a cavern on Clintar. That's the symbiote homeworld. Though it does have memories of being present on Gore's homeworld as well, so it's a little confusing. Basically, in the ancient past, the symbiote was once the loyal thrall of Null, but at some point the symbiote refused to obey his wishes anymore, and Venom was cast out of the hive, doomed to wander aimlessly across the cosmos. The symbiote eventually discovered the Kree explorers, who decided to harvest it for further study. It was then bonded to a soldier named Telkar, and underwent months of training alongside him before they were dispatched to fight in the Kree Skrull War. Before eventually leaving Telkar, and after a whack more adventures, the symbiote ended up becoming bonded to Spider-Man during Secret Wars. Number 2. Etrigan Etrigan the demon was the firstborn of Belial, who was such a a handful that Belial 
exiled Etrigan's mother to Masak Mavdil and told his son that his antics drove her away. That's a bad dad. I don't think this is the son's fault. His antics that we just talked about ended up even driving Belial out of hell for several decades, returning with another son born of a mortal witch named Merlin. Etrigan was originally summoned to Earth to serve Merlin in a desperate final attempt to protect Camelot from the evil witch Morgan Le Fay. Merlin bound the demon to a mortal man named Jason, and while Merlin went into hiding to rest. These two lived a very long and brutal life through history. Basically, how it would go is that Etrigan incited war and strife, and in return, Jason gained wealth and status. Not a horrible idea, but despite sharing the same body, the demon and his host are usually at odds with each other, and Jason, retains a lot of guilt based on Etrigan's actions, which I think played a part in him being a bit more heroic, or as heroic as a demon can be. But finally, in at number one, it's Thor. Being the son of Odin the Allfather, who appeared in part one, and Gaia, an elder god who appeared on this list, Thor is incredibly old, approximately 4,000 years, although at other times it has been said to be even longer. Thor has all the incredible powers of the Asgardians, but boosted to a whole other level thanks to his mother's elder god status. As the god of strength, as well as thunder, he is one of the strongest Marvel characters, being able to either defeat or stalemate astronomically stronger beings like the Midgard Serpent, the Hulk, the Silver Surfer, Gladiator, and Hercules. His stamina lets him basically fight forever, and he's next to completely invulnerable. Not to mention his weather and energy manipulation and the use of his hammer, which make this guy almost impossible to bring down. Even when he isn't in possession of his hammer and is just Thor Odinson, he is still a force to be reckoned with, and especially recently, he keeps getting more and more boost to his power. This character has been around for an incredibly long time, and he just gets more and more powerful as time goes on. I never said we have ancient Ghost Rider. Ghost Rider on a freaking mammoth? Are you kidding me? Back when Earth was an untamed land inhabited by tribes of cavemen, the young boy who would become the first Ghost Rider was brilliant among his pack, but he kept this to himself, fearing isolation. One day, a strange man confronts the tribe, swiftly becoming the leader of their pack through violent means, and eventually revealing himself to be a Wendigo before devouring the entire tribe, save for the young boy. Before the Wendigo leaves, he names the boy Ghost and challenges the boy to find him. With everyone he'd ever known gone, Ghost ventures beyond his cave, deciding that if the stranger could survive out there in the world, so could he. Ghost then embarks on a quest to survive and find his newfound adversary. Alone in a new turbulent environment, Ghost nearly succumbs to exhaustion, but at that moment he's approached by a talking serpent who bestows upon Ghost the spirit of vengeance as a means of achieving his goal, transforming him to the very first Ghost Rider. Fast forward five years and the stage is set for a showdown. Ghost on the back of a flaming mammoth confronts the Wendigo, engaging in a battle that ends with the Wendigo pushing Ghost atop the mammoth off a cliff a fall that only the rider would survive. Alone once more, the ghost was approached by Odin and Lady Phoenix, who would ask him to join the prehistoric Avengers. By the way, if Ghost Rider on a mammoth isn't cool enough for you, then try the Ghost Rider of the Hyborian Age about 990,000 years later, when the Ghost Rider of that era rode a giant spider. The Spider Rider would go on to confront Conan the Barbarian, and while we don't know how that showdown ends, you can definitely bet it would be a battle of the ages. Well, the Hyborian Age specifically. And speaking of which... Number 9, Conan Conan the Barbarian. Conan was born on a carnage-strewn battlefield in the hills of the westernmost region of Chimeria, all the way back in the Hyborian Age, aka around 13 to 10,000 BC. The fact that Conan was born on a battlefield was considered to be an omen that Conan would grow up to be a great warrior one day. And Conan was one of the most accomplished swordsmen of the Hyborian Age. He has unusually high strength, agility, and speed for a human. He has lifted immense objects or enemies, even using his bare hands to bring down a raging bull when he was still relatively young. It's said that he has the strength equivalent of 10 to 20 men. More often than not though, Conan relies upon his lightning fast reflexes in combat situations and they've very rarely failed him. On top of that, he has a massive level of durability and through years of dealing with sorcerers, magicians, and witches, he has even developed a moderate level of resistance to magic and mind control spells. Conan is a master warrior. He has a hardy survival instinct, is a master of stealth, and is multilingual. While primarily known as a wandering sellsword, Conan progressively became a master tactician, leading entire armies into battle, and eventually, Conan even became king of Aquilonia, wherever that is. And also, eventually, a hero interacting with the heroes of the modern day. If you're enjoying the videos so far, you can support the channel by pressing like, subscribing to Top 10 Nerd, and ringing that notification bell. Moving on to number 8, we have Odin Borson. Wait, did any of you guys know that the Allfather's last name is Borson? Just me? Okay. Odin Borson. 
born from the union of Bor, the son of Buri, and Besla, a giantess, emerged alongside his brothers Kul, Vili, and Viz. I definitely butchered that, I'm so sorry. Together, these divine siblings embarked on a cosmic odyssey that would reshape reality itself. They dared to challenge Ymir, the frost giant, forging the very fabric of the cosmos and existence itself from Ymir's remains. Asgard, the celestial realm, blossomed from the remnants of Ymir, becoming the abode of gods in the heart of their dominion. Yet Odin's exploits were not limited to creation alone. One day, a sentient and all-powerful storm known as the God Tempest threatened the sanctity of Asgard. Odin, as mighty as the storm was, stood resolute against its fury, and with a display of power that echoed through the cosmos, Odin quelled the Tempest, imprisoning its essence within a fragment of Uru, which would one day become the legendary Mjolnir, a symbol of power and worthiness. Sometime after forging Mjolnir, but long before the birth of Thor, Odin descended upon Midgard, then known as Aesheim, where he bestowed upon the world the gift of humanity. However, even the gods' benevolence can be tempered with enigmatic purpose. Bor, his father, was not entirely pleased with Odin's creation, casting upon humanity the mantle of suffering. As eons swept by, Odin's saga intertwined with the Stone Age. See, Mjolnir proved difficult to wield, leading Odin to forge an alliance with mystically empowered prehistoric humans. Together, they united as the Stone Age Avengers, the guardians of Earth's fragile yet flourishing existence. Number 8, Nabu. Dr. Fate is one of the most powerful magic users in DC Comics, but funnily enough, Dr. Fate is just a name used by the wearers of the Helmet of Fate, which was created by the powerful sorcerer Nabu. Nabu is actually billions of years old as one of the cosmic beings known as the Lords of Order. They came into being at the beginning of the universe and struggled with the Lords of Chaos for supremacy. The Lords of Order actually manifested themselves as the first sentient race in the universe, but it wasn't until 35 500 BC in Earth years that one of the Lords of Order descended to Earth and became Nabu the Wise, an advisor to the pharaohs of ancient Egypt. In the New 52 continuity, he is a bit more human and credited as one of the first discoverers of magic, but regardless, after years and years and years serving pharaohs, Nabu did eventually quote, pass on, or it's more so that his physical body could no longer contain him and so his spirit was absorbed into magical items, mainly the Helmet of Fate, allowing him to live on through it and whoever puts the helmet on their head. Number 7, The Wizard. Mamoragon, or The Wizard, or just Shazam's origin story is deeply rooted in ancient mysticism and magic. He was an ancient wizard who once belonged to an order known as the Council of Eternity, sworn to safeguard the realms from supernatural threats. Thousands of years ago, during the days of ancient Egypt, Mamoragon was granted incredible magical powers tied to the six gods of Solomon, Hercules, Atlas, Zeus, Achilles, and Mercury. As the wielder of the magic word Shazam, Mamoragon could channel the combined abilities of the six figures, bestowing those powers upon a worthy champion. However, when his first champion, Teth Adam, aka Black Adam, fell to darkness, Mamoragon sealed the powers away for centuries. In the modern era, Mamoragon's essence endured, choosing the young Billy Batson as his new champion. When Billy utters the word Shazam, he transforms into the superhero Shazam, embodying the collective powers that Mamoragon once had. Held. Mamoragon's origin story is a tapestry of ancient magic, responsibility, and the passing of the torch to a new generation of heroes who carry his legacy in the form of Shazam. He was a hero, but has kind of become something much more important. Number six. Hercules. Hercules is the son of Zeus, sky father and supreme ruler of the gods of Olympus, and Alcmena, a mortal woman who lived over 3,000 years ago. Athena, the goddess of wisdom, arranged for her father Zeus to have a half mortal son to be the world's champion. Zeus seduced the mortal queen Alcmena, pretending to be her husband, King Amphitryon, I think is how you pronounce that, and Alcmena gave birth to the baby Hercules. Now, as an adult demigod in ancient Greece, Hercules achieved worldwide fame as he became the greatest hero of the ancient world, best known for his 12 labors. As the Olympian god of strength as well, Hercules' strength is unlimited, making him one of the strongest and most powerful heroes in the Marvel Universe. As an infant, he was breastfed by his stepmother, Hera, queen of the Olympian gods, which increased his already demigod physiology to a godlike level. Hercules possesses the superhuman physical attributes of an Olympian god, but interestingly, some of his powers are superior to the vast majority of his own race. Most 
Most recently though, he is a member of the Guardians of the Galaxy, but he has also been a part of the Avengers, the God Squad, the Council of Godheads, the Mighty Avengers, the Secret Avengers, the Defenders, the Heroes for Hire, and of course, S.H.I.E.L.D. Number 5, Anthro. Created by Howard Post, Anthro is considered the first boy on Earth, existing in prehistoric times. He lived with his family during a period when the world was still in its primal stages. Anthro's curiosity and adaptability drove him to explore the challenges and mysteries of a world populated by both primitive creatures and nascent human tribes. Through his adventures, Anthro unwittingly played a significant role in shaping humanity's development and survival, often making use of his ingenuity and courage to overcome obstacles, while also being a part of some modern age stories thanks to time travel. He's popped up in Crisis on Infinite Earths, Armageddon 2001, Zero Hour, Team 13, and Final Crisis, and he's even been to the Marvel Universe where he interacted with Devil Dinosaur. Anthro's narrative explores the struggle for survival, the emergence of intelligence, and the foundation of human civilization. His story reflects the essence of human curiosity, resilience, and the quest for progress, serving as a symbol of humanity's earliest steps into the unknown. His powers are, well, pretty much non-existent, but he has played a part in some big events and in more than just the background kind of way. Number 4, The Ancient One. Born over a thousand years ago, The Ancient One, otherwise known as Yao, was a local to the Tibetan ancient city of Kamartaj. Under the guidance of the mystic sorcerer Kalu, Yao delved into the ancient arts of magic and arcane wisdom, eventually surpassing and even facing his mentor. After facing his mentor, granting himself long life and fighting alongside sorcerer supremes throughout time, he sought out an order of ancient magic users known as the Ancient Ones in order to devote his entire life to their goal of combating evil sorcerers. The youth eventually became even more skilled than his colleagues though and grew in power so great that he was the first mortal ever of Earth to meet with Eternity, the sentient embodiment of the universe, who presented him with the amulet of Agamotto and charged him to become their Earth's dimensions Sorcerer Supreme. After spending a ton of time trying to sculpt a successor and having multiple possible choices, Yao eventually passed on and left the Sorcerer Supreme mantle to Dr. Stephen Strange. Number 3, I Vampire. Vampires in DC Comics are practically indestructible and can regenerate any damage done by consuming blood. They have superhuman strength, speed, reflexes, stamina, can transform into bats, wolves, rats, and mist, and have enhanced senses and a bit of psychokinesis. But despite that, they do have some major weaknesses that pretty much everyone is aware of, with a big one being the frickin' sun, unless they can find a way to temporarily make themselves immune. But for I Vampire, otherwise known as Andrew Bennett, the former 16th century English nobleman in Queen Elizabeth's court, he has a peculiar ability to eventually automatically revive himself after he is sent to the grave. Even if he becomes a pile of ashes from the sun, he has even survived the end of the universe. I don't know how that's possible. The ability is a bit of a mystery, even to Bennett himself. When he survived the end of the universe, it was at the will of the presence, leaving some to believe that this may be true in all cases, but that's not actually confirmed. Whatever the reason, it has allowed him to survive as a heroic vegetarian vampire all the way until the modern day. Number 2, Dream. The Endless, featured in DC's Sandman story, is a group of seven siblings. Death, Destiny, Despair, Desire, Delirium, Destruction, and the focus of our point today, Dream. These siblings represent fundamental aspects and forces of the Vertigo slash DC universe, and they are all immortal, ageless and nigh omnipotent. The parents of the Endless were revealed to be the embodiment of time, father of the Endless, and night, the embodiment of the infinite darkness that existed before the dawn of the universe, and the mother of the Endless. So it's safe to say that these beings are probably pretty ancient. like. 10 billion years ancient. They came from the beginning of the universe. As for Dream, or Morpheus, he isn't so much a superhero as we are used to, but he is an extremely powerful, reluctant hero. And his journey to that status from emotionless god to a being displaying very human-like emotions and characteristics is the fundamental story of the Sandman. Dream dwells in a realm called the Dreaming, from where he controlled the fundamental concept of fantasy and reality in the universe. As the line between the waking world 
world and the dreams is quite thin. And in at number one today, it's Hippolyta. This queen's history begins thousands of years ago, around 1300 BC. The Greek pantheon held a meeting convened by the goddesses. They were discussing the creation of a race of humans that would champion their ideals. The male gods, including Zeus and Ares, did not seem interested in this, and Hera did not wish to go against her husband. So it was left to the other primary female Greek goddesses. They decided to travel into the underworld where they came upon the Well of Souls, where the souls of all the women murdered by men's hatred were gathered together. The goddesses took these souls and went and dropped them into a lake in Greece. The souls mixed with the clay and the stone of the lake bed to form the Amazons, and the first one to emerge from the waters was Hippolyta. The goddesses appointed Hippolyta, or Hippolyta, however you want to pronounce it, to be queen, and they decreed that the Amazons were to spread the message of peace, tolerance, and equality by being super dope warriors. Yes, Wonder Woman is also pretty ancient too, but Mama came first, so here we are. Sorry. At number 10 is Hercules. In the realm of ancient legends, Hercules emerges as the ultimate superhero. Born millennia ago to Zeus and Alcmana, his feats defy imagination. At just one year old, he strangled serpents sent by Hera, revealing his immense strength. He joined the Agronauts on their quest for the Golden Fleece, but never abandoned the search for his abducted friend, Helas, even at the cost of parting ways with his crew. Hercules possesses demigod-like powers, which includes immunity to aging and disease, tirelessness, superhuman strength and agility, and near invulnerability. Mortal wounds can't claim him unless they're cataclysmic to say the least. Armed with a golden mace and other legendary weapons, he's a master of combat with a legendary reputation for romance and revelry. And with muscles like that, how could you not be a total womanizer? At number 9 is the Parliament of Trees. While the Swamp Thing is a newcomer in the vast DC universe, I mean relatively speaking, he derives his powers from an ancient primordial force known as the Green, or the Parliament of Trees. This force intricately weaves its tendrils through every blade of grass every towering tree, and all plant life on our planet. But the true marvel lies in the Parliament of Trees, which is a council of former plant elementals whose existence predates humanity by hundreds of millions of years. These beings have witnessed the rise and fall of countless civilizations, outlasting even the mighty dinosaurs. Today, they join forces with the Swamp Thing, an earthly avatar, to safeguard the delicate balance of our environment. In this alliance, they prove themselves as ancient superheroes, guardians of a world far older than man mankind itself. If you're enjoying this video so far, you can support this channel by pressing like, subscribing to Top 10 Nerd, and ringing that notification bell. I would really appreciate if you did do all those things. At number 8 is Beowulf. Beowulf is a legendary Gaetish king who stands as an enduring ancient superhero. His reign spanned 50 years before a dragon, harboring secrets of the Holy Grail, brought his end. James Allison speculated that his heroic tales, including the dragon battle, were imprinted in our collective memory from a past life encounter with a mysterious worm. And by the way, if you're wondering, James Allison is some dude whose power is to see his past incarnations. Anyways, these stories were later transformed into an epic poem, albeit with artistic embellishments, solidifying Beowulf's place among legendary heroes. But according to Marvel Comics, Beowulf actually survived his duel against the dragon and somehow managed to live into the modern age when Beowulf resurfaced as an immortal warrior, engaging in a friendly rivalry with Theseus. He even joined a coalition of warriors led by Hercules to confront new gods seeking to overthrow the old pantheon. Beowulf's timeless saga reminds us that some heroes remain eternally captivating. Number 7, The Immortal. Due to an accident that happened approximately 3,000 years ago, the man who became Invincible's Immortal was exposed to an unknown anomaly that gave him superhuman abilities that put him almost on par with Vilchermites, making him one of three known beings in the universe that can make that claim. But but outside of his incredible strength, speed, durability, stamina, and flight powers, the immortal is, you guessed it, immortal. Able to regenerate at an insanely fast rate, regrowing limbs and organs, not needing food, water, or oxygen to survive, and being immune to all poisons, toxins, venoms, viruses, bacteria, parasites, pathogens, and allergens. However, funnily enough, there is a way to quote, 
kill him. If the immortal's head is separated from his torso, it needs to be manually reattached for his healing factor to activate. But despite that, even when they aren't attached, he still remains perfectly preserved until the reattachment happens. He's been around for so long that he has been a knight, possibly under King Arthur as Lancelot, an explorer under or possibly as Christopher Columbus in the Spanish Armada. He fought in the American Revolution, became president of the United States by taking the alias of this guy you may know called Abraham Lincoln, and he fought as a soldier in the First World War. In the 1930s is when he officially became a superhero and more recently became a member of the Guardians of the Globe. At number six is Phoenix. We begin with an abandoned infant named Firehair left to her own devices at a place aptly named the Burnt Place. It wasn't a cozy nursery, mind you, but a clearing where xenophobic tribes try to sacrifice anyone who manifested appearances which strayed from their norm. In this case, the child's red hair. The abandoned infant found herself being raised by an unlikely family, a pack of wolves. Wolves, the original guardians of the forest. Perhaps a canine paw father is what every superhero needs. One fateful day's fire hair solitude was interrupted by a floating man who conversed through thoughts. No need for that pesky small talk. This floating mentor, which fire hair fondly dubbed as the High Walker, introduced her to a congregation of adopted mutants called the Tribe Without Fear, offering refuge and training. Fast forward and fire hair's psychic abilities awaken just in time to sound the alarm about an impending attack from the xenophobes from earlier. As the High Walker faced off against the invading tribes, then Firehair's psyche is overwhelmed by the storm of human emotion. Sadly, the High Walker meets his end while trying to calm her. Firehair fainted as her fellow pupils gave into rage and fought the attacking tribesmen, resulting in the demise of everyone present, save for herself. Firehair blamed herself for her mentor and friend's demise and was overcome with despair, contemplating turning her powers on herself to unalive herself, returning to the burnt place to be eaten by buzzards. As she lay awaiting her demise, the Phoenix Force, an ancient cosmic entity with a penchant for turning planets into cinder, who had had created the burnt place when it first arrived on Earth, bonds with Firehair having been drawn to her raw and untapped psychic power. Consumed by a vengeful rage, Firehair almost gave in to the bloodlust and became a dark phoenix, but she was pacified thanks to the one who had saved her as an infant, her paw father, if you will. From that day forward, she would take a page out of the wolf playbook and decide to protect the weak rather than lay waste to the universe. Realizing the threat that beings such as herself posed to the integrity of Earth, she began assembling a team of supernatural and mystically augmented heroes to protect the nation's humanity humanity from both outside threats and themselves, and thus founding the Avengers of the Stone Age. Number 5. Exodus Grand Duke Benny du Perry was a 12th century nobleman from medieval France in Marvel Comics. Does that count as ancient? I don't know anyone who's around then, so I'm taking it and running with it. What are you going to do about it? Nothing, because I'm just an image on your screen. As an adult, Benet was a crusader for the Knights Templar sent to Jerusalem during the Crusades, and he even became best friends with Eobar Garrington, aka the Black Knight of that era. The two had set out on a quest to find the Tower of Power, which is a stupid name. When his abilities manifested after an encounter with the Phoenix Force, which were then improved further thanks to the mutant apocalypse. But thanks to Big Blue, Exodus was trapped in a tomb until the modern day when he was awoken by Magneto and joined his cause. Exodus is one of the most powerful psionic mutants in existence, with such a pristine use of telekinesis and telepathy that he can even alter electrons and molecules. His power is so strong that Marvel even had to debuff him by making his powers dependent on his or others level of faith in this mutant. Although he still regularly kicks some serious butt. At number four is Agamotto. Now speaking of ancient superheroes, let's uncover a figure whose power and influence might just leave you spellbound. No, he's not your everyday magician pulling rabbits out of hats. We're talking about the cosmic conjurer who would give Doctor Strange a run for his money. Imagine being tutored by a deity, Oshurder no less, the literal elder goddess of Earth. But Agamotto wasn't just a student he went on to become Earth's very first Sorcerer Supreme. Agamotto would go on to face cosmic threats like the Fallen, and yes, even Dormammu, which he thwarted alongside the Stone Age Avengers. Now let's talk artifacts. The legend of Agamotto was like an Indiana Jones fever dream as he'd created magical treasures that would make a dragon's horde look like pocket change. First off, we got the eyes, that's right, eyes, plural, of Agamotto. You might remember one of those as the pendant in Doctor Strange's possession that guards the Time Stone. Well, Agamotto made not one, not two, but three of them bad boys. But but their intended purpose wasn't meant to guard infinity stones or serve as reading glasses. These peepers could pierce through dimensions, unlocking knowledge that could make Google's search engine blush. Ever heard of the Book of Vishanti? Yup, that was Agamotto's brainchild too. An enchanted book that's like Wikipedia but for spells. Agamotto went from being a mere mortal sorcerer supreme to being a bona fide higher being, a principality. Essentially imagine a being so magically advanced that you become a go-to power source for other sorcerers. Sort of like being the neighborhood electrician for the mystical realm. So there you have 
have it. Agamotto, the ancient superhero who wasn't just reading spells from a dusty book, he was writing them into that dusty book, shaping the very fabric of reality, defending Earth from cosmic threats, and leaving behind a trail of magical breadcrumbs for future sorcerers to follow. Number three, Starbrand Vin. The Starbrand itself is an incredible source of power, proven by other people who have wielded it. The bearer of Earth 723 Starbrand used the power to create music that influenced human behavior to the extent that he has unified the people of his world as a single hive mind. Earth 541 is the home of a Starbrand bearer who has conquered his world and installed himself as the head of a benevolent monarchical dictatorship, but like a good one that actually somehow works despite the lack of freedoms. Thing is, what the Starbrand is capable of is dependent on its wielder's imagination. When it first showed up on Earth, it was millions and millions of years ago coming down with a meteor that wiped out the dinosaurs, but in doing so, it bonded itself to a Tyrannosaurus Rex, which is absolutely awesome. After a few millions of years though, that T-Rex had gone belly up, and the Starbrand found a new bearer in the form of a caveman named Vin. It's just VNN, I don't know why it's pronounced like that. Interestingly though, when Vin came upon the Starbrand and used it to join up with the Avengers 1 million BC, he was actually more analogous to like the Hulk, at least in his looks, and he had a more primitive use of the Starbrand than other future bearers. But he did live on the moon for a bit and help fight a celestial, so don't get it twisted, he did more than just punch stuff. At number two is the first Black Panther. Meet Mosi, a member of the Black Panther tribe in the legendary land of Wakanda. Now he wasn't the first of his tribe to munch on the heart shape herb, but he was the first to survive the experience as he caught the attention of a powerful entity known as Bast, the Panther Spirit. And let me tell you folks, that wasn't your ordinary herbal experience. We're in ancient Wakanda after all, not modern Canada. With Bast's blessing, Mosi became the very first Black Panther. Talk about leveling up. It was around this time that Earth was dealing with some cosmic turbulence courtesy of a meteor from the Vega system. The rifts it opened up started inviting all sorts of extraterrestrial nasties, like the Brood, to the neighborhood. Not one to let his tribe become an all-you-can-eat buffet for these cosmic creeps, Mosi stepped in as Wakanda's defender-in-chief. And guess who else decided to crash the party? None other than Odin Borison, the Asgardian bigwig himself. Now, Odin wasn't exactly known for tossing around compliments like confetti, but he had to admit he was pretty darn impressed with Mosi's moral moxie. And if that was enough, get this, Mosi was the first person after Odin to ever live to Mjolnir, proving his worthiness during the first encounter with the rest of the Stone Age Avengers. Mosi and his crew sealed away a colossal celestial, saving the day like it was just another Wednesday. They faced off against cosmic villains like Mephisto and Shumagora, making your average supervillain seem about as threatening as a fluffy kitten. But alas, all good things must come to an end. Mosi met his match in a battle against the children of Lofi and Hive, and his sacrifice marked the end of this ancient Avengers era. The team disbanded with Mosi's demise and also caused the Wakandan people to retreat from the outside world, requesting that the Avengers forget their existence. The nation would then segment into tribes and were not reunited again until the rise of the second Black Panther, Alumo Bashenga. And finally, in at number one today is Mr. Majestic. DC Comics' Mr. Majestic, also known as Magistros, is a character of immense power and capability that often surprises readers with the extent of his abilities. Hailing from an advanced alien race known as the Caribbean, Majestic possesses superhuman strength, speed, and durability that rivals even the mightiest of superheroes. Unlike the lesser cast, however, he is a carabum of imperial blood, meaning he has a host of cosmic tier physical and mental abilities. Majestic has demonstrated the power to manipulate matter and energy at a molecular level, able to discharge any manner of energy he has on hand however he sees fit, rearranging the subatomic structure of objects, or charging his fists with energy to increase his punching strength. Speaking of strength though, he has rearranged most of the planets in the solar system by just pushing them from his own power and has crushed graphite into diamonds in order to pay for a meal, which those two things are very, very different. On top of all of that though, Majestic is basically Wildstorm's analog for Superman and shares a lot of the same abilities as the Man of Steel. And when interacting with the rest of the DC multiverse, he's considered to be an alternate Earth Superman. Oh, and he makes this list because, being a cherubim, he is about 10,000 years old.